to a lot of us, even those of us who believe strongly that quality and safety are our job one, it takes real dedicated work to make sure you do those things. The physicians of the past were socialized to believe that their highest value was the care of this individual patient in front of them. And there's something quite noble about that. We didn't realize that by that intense focus simply on the individual patient and me doing everything I can in the care of that patient, I and others like me completely neglected the importance of teamwork. If there was a condition that I faced that was unsafe for that patient, or there was a, there's a supply I needed to have for that patient, my instinct, the instinct of every doctor and nurse, would be to run to another floor and snarf it. I would grab it, and so I would then have it in the care of my patient, but it probably would not have crossed my mind, nor would it have been obvious through the work of the institution to somehow flag that as a situation where the next patient who comes along is going to be in trouble because the situation is going to be completely unchanged. Five or six years ago when we UCSF finally took a hard look at itself, although we had plenty of areas of spectacular quality, our system of care as a whole was not as safe as it should be. And it was at that point that we embarked on a new a new effort, a new view, a new culture to increase safety and quality at UCSF and at UCSF Medical Center. If we can't get that drug, the right drug to the right patient at the right dose at the right time, if that breaks down, then the rest is for naught. When our previous Chief Medical Officer, Ernie Ring, uh, started, he met with me and asked what our infection rate was. Uh, he was aware this is an important outcome in the ICUs. And I had to tell him I didn't know because I didn't have the resources to actually even measure those infections. And so Ernie was willing to provide the resources where we could have some ICU nurses essentially reassigned to do surveillance for these infections. About that time, we also tried, started some training programs for the residents that worked in the ICU that included some hands-on training, some simulation as well, and started to measure our infection rates. And I would say that was really the landmark event where we actually had data. Well, door to balloon time for acute MI is uh, something we've been doing for uh, several decades now, but we've been concentrating on the time aspect of it probably for the last six or seven years very, very acutely. We used to look at falls and pressure ulcers as an aggregate, and now we look individually because we know that patients are not the same on the medicine unit as they are on a surgical unit. They're not the same in the neurointensive care unit as they are in the cardiac intensive care unit. Out of all the medication errors admin administered to patients, only 4% of them are caught We've been very actively involved in research with respiratory failure and pneumonia. So that actually was initially part of one of our research uh, projects, but then we transitioned into being our standard of care. I remember the, our former chief medical officer, one of the things he said to me once was, I need the chairs of every department, surgery, medicine, neurology, pediatrics, I need them to wake up in the morning and say, I care as much today about the quality and safety of the care that is being delivered by the faculty and trainees in my department as I care about the quality of the trainees that we recruit, uh, how we did in our grants last year. That's a big paradigm shift for a place like this. Central line uh, infections unfortunately continued to be a problem and uh, at the time that I arrived we actually didn't even know how large a problem. We weren't collecting the data uh, that would be necessary for us to measure that. Um, and uh, uh, as far as I could tell, just anecdotally, it seemed like almost every week we had another patient with a central line infection. It was seeing real data, comparing UCSF Medical Center to other prestigious medical centers in the country and showing that we were not doing as well as we thought we were doing, I think was a very powerful uh, event for us and was a, had been a real driving force ever since. Originally it was two hours, now we're down to uh, a goal of 90 minutes from the time the patient first reaches the door of the hospital 
till your artery is uh, open and flow is reestablished. And we're looking specifically at uh, our myocardial infarction patients uh, with a particular type of myocardial infarction called a uh, ST segment elevation, or the acronym of a STEMI. How long uh, th th does it take us to reperfuse that patient's blocked coronary artery from the minute they uh, reach the emergency room door uh, until that happens? And I think anybody that's doing this uh, procedure needs to be monitoring it closely to see how effective they are and how timely you're delivering. Because we're electronic, um, we have immediate access to an event. So if someone falls, I get a chance to see that incident immediately and I can go to the bedside and help to assess the patient. Just reducing falls is a, a big initiative for us, but we also want to reduce injury from fall. We're in real time now, so we get a chance to talk to the patient. We want to include the patient also. What do you think happened? How could we prevent this? So we started doing root cause analyses here, I'd say about seven years ago. I think in the beginning, we were a little bit haphazard about it. Uh, we kind of patched one together when a bad error happened. And starting about three or four, three years ago, I guess we reorganized the root cause analysis process to the point that it is now, I believe, the best I've seen in the country. No one has really shown uh, a zero infection rate for ventilator-associated pneumonia, but we actually have, again, uh, reduced our infection rates about 50% year over year the last three or four years. Um, this is very labor intensive. It's a broader uh, approach to this. In a multidisciplinary way, um, the nursing staff uh, were very important, the infection control group, um, pediatric infectious disease, uh, and physicians and pharmacy all came together to, um, to try to tackle this problem. And um, the first thing that we needed to do and that was done was to collect the data in terms of the number of line days and actually the uh, numbers and types of infection. And uh, uh, the nursing staff and infection control were absolutely crucial to getting this information. Um, subsequently, with uh, further education and emphasis on hand hygiene, at looking at uh, everything that had to do with our practice in terms of delivery of care, um, we were able to cut down from what was uh, an original rate when we started measuring of over um, five uh, central line related infections per thousand line days to um, within a year we had cut that down to just over two. So uh, thus meeting both our own internal goal as well as at the same time meeting the hospital goals. The, the reason that data is, is so important to us is that um, we otherwise would not know whether the changes that we're making actually have any effect. And if you don't see what the benefit of those changes are in particular, it can cause a change in morale that's not necessarily beneficial. We did lower our infection rates, which is, which is wonderful. Um, we even had a period of greater than 100 days where we didn't have any infections. And I think it really made people feel like, come together and feel like, hey, we're really accomplishing something. You know, whereas before we had, you know, all these infections and everybody talked about the fact that, boy, you know, we have another infected baby. All of a sudden now, you know, after a lot of hard work, a lot of changes, um, we're celebrating the fact that we've gotten an entire, you know, more than three months without any infections, which is, which is quite a change from the history of the intensive care nursery. Safety we see as providing care that is as expected and causes no harm. The emergency room uh, physician quickly looks at the electrocardiogram, makes the diagnosis, and, has, and calls one operator who then phones the entire team. And uh, we don't question that we're getting paged, we just all come in. And that saves uh, quite a bit of time. And, we, and various members of the team, some meet the patient in the ER, the rest of us go to the cath lab, get the procedure all, all set up, bring the patient there. And that's been a big time saver uh, having the uh, direct activation of the team by the emergency room. We have a lot of uh, activations that really aren't STEMIs, but that's I think part of the uh, price you pay to get a quick time where we, you know, some of the patients probably really didn't uh, have the correct diagnosis made, but uh, we come in and take care of that too. You're taking people that are extremely sick. I mean, in many cases, actually dying and re resuscitating them, and you bring them back if you can do this in a timely manner. So there's a good, noble cause here. It's not just trying to uh, be a quick time. We're trying to do it uh, for, for good patient care and saving, uh, saving heart and muscle.
one of our you know, biggest sources of medication errors is human error. Automation is key. Now, granted, we're you know, driving automation with the human component, but the, the steps along the way are now going to be automated and much safer. One of the most significant changes that we've made is we've brought in more pharmacy uh, oversight for the preparation of the actual doses and ensuring the safe storage of them. Getting to where we are now has created a substantially different kind of work. It's really teamwork. It's all of the people who are involved in the care of a type of patient or even might be involved in those types of patients. And there are many of the people you'd think nurses, pharmacists, physicians, but a lot of people you wouldn't necessarily think. Environmental services, technicians, medical records, information technology. We've had to bring to the table all of those professionals to really achieve the level of safety that we have in certain areas. It's that teamwork approach, that view that this type of thing takes a team I think is also one of those core requirements for getting your level of safety and quality to be the highest it can possibly be. From a pressure ulcer perspective, uh, from the operating room and the emergency department, the assessment, again, like falls, starts there. So the nurses are making an assessment. We have it on our handoff, both falls and pressure ulcer risk on our handoff so when the nurse is giving report to the nurse on the floor or in the ICU that is one of the domains covered that we're worried about falls we're worried about pressure ulcer or that there's an existing problem already the same for operating room or in the emergency department patients can stay on surfaces for a long period of time that um, prior to our initiatives uh, were a much harder surface we weren't as focused about getting patients onto um, a pressure relieving surface nearly as quickly as we are these days. So when we know that someone's at risk, we get them on a pressure relieving surface in the ED right away. Same with the OR. Again, there's that handoff communication. We're all worried about it, so we know there's a bed waiting in the ICU or on the floor when someone comes out of the OR. One thing we've done with our root cause analysis is, is, is give it a fixed time period, meaning that we meet generally every Wednesday from 9 to 11. It's a standing meeting. Uh, the reason I think that's so important is, is in the beginning we said, why should we have a standing meeting? We'll have one when something nasty happens. Uh, but it's after a while you realize there are enough bad things that happen that you're better off having a fixed time interval. And having a fixed time actually lowered our threshold for using that process because we knew we would have a group of people together. We would sometimes say that was a really bad near miss. Nobody got harmed but we got lucky. Let's go ahead and analyze it using this method and using the committees. We have about 10 frontline caregivers. Uh, anyone who's involved in the case comes to the meeting and they're quite naturally scared. They've just gotten a call from the office of the chief medical officer to come and talk about something that was bad that happened, maybe a patient's death. I mean, sometimes these are terrible things. The person who runs the meeting, usually our associate chief medical officer, Adrian Green, begins the meeting by saying, this is about fixing systems, not pointing fingers. Uh, we need all of you here because we need your wisdom. We need to learn what happened from your perspective. Uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll come up with some ideas about ways of fixing this. And one of the things she sometimes will do is say to them, tell us why this might not work in your world. You know, we know patient safety, we know systems, but we don't know what life is like on the labor and delivery suite at one in the morning, you do. So you tell us why this might or might not work, or if you can think of a better way of making this kind of fix work. That kind of give and take is essential. I think the whole process has really elevated our approach to patient safety and quality. Uh, and I think it's become a national model. When I speak about this at other organizations, I see people furiously taking notes, and I know a number of other organizations that have now emulated our model. We've looked at our, our, our record here and compared it to, to others on the registry, and yes, we have achieved, the, uh, as a percentage of patients, the best door-to-balloon time in the country for several, uh, several different quarters in a row, where virtually 100% of our patients are done under 90 minutes, and over 90% of them are done under 60 minutes. Um, that re reflects, uh, the, again, a lot of hard work and some luck uh, to do that, but we're very proud of that and hopefully we can continue that. So we've gotten, I think, to that place 
We've done a huge amount of work in individual areas around medication safety, around uh, preventing hospital-acquired infections and hospital-acquired injuries, improving communication, defining real outcomes, just holding ourselves accountable to measuring something, and putting resources into improving the results of the measurement. So because of that really cultural change, I think we are now poised to take quality and safety to an extremely high level. We'd like to be the safest hospital in the world.